Bob asked me to give some uh, quick talk of the things that I've been doing, and it was I'm just really a mapper, I'm just somebody that goes out and creates the map. I'm, I'm not a, a user of data, I don't do visualizations or anything like that, so I've just got some, uh, some pictures of maps and things, and I'm just going to talk about really what I've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, I kind of started mapping in December 2010, so I've been doing this for three and a bit years. Um, Years, um, so, so since, since September 2010, um, apparently I've made just over half a million changes to the OpenStreetMap. Um, as you can see on the on the, on the right here, the um, primarily based in Scotland um, and kind of most most of the way across Scotland. Um, that's the area I'm in best. Um, although I have made some other pet trends, we'll talk about it later. Um, and really just starting off mapping things like paths, tracks, road names, and kind of going on and looking at lots of other things. So we'll just kind of talk about that and then a little bit on sort of the of the street map, which uh, Bob talked about earlier. So we're just going to you know, add a few bits to that. Um, really, I suppose started this um, using the Cycle Streets app, which I think we've got the guys from Cycle Streets are here. And, and um, that was kind of my first instruction to OpenStreetMap was seeing, oh, this is a really useful data set, but I saw there was problems with it. There was bits were missing, and then I found out I could add bits. Um, and if lots of people like me added bits, then suddenly we had a brilliant map. And well, it kind of it now is the best cycle map, I think. Um, so the thing up there, kind of just simple cut throughs in, in the urban environment. I mean. Global people know that you can just nip down here, and when that gets added, then you know everything you can send you down there, and you can get a really good shortcut. And so you get all this local knowledge, but right across the country, and that's really useful. And the other thing that's been added right across the country now is pretty much all the mountain bike trails have been added, and, and a lot of them are even kind of tell you how difficult they are, and so on. Uh, these are the ones up at Gold Street, which. I've cycled quite a few times and so went around and up and down from uh, GPS and, and also from being a you can actually see where the track is because there's places where GPS doesn't work too well on trees and such like. Um, another thing is, is adding paths from, from doing hill walking. So I mean, I'm kind of an outdoor type person and just, it's just areas I'm interested in. And, um, and the paths don't actually really show up very well on, on the map here, but you can see so the main tracks coming up here. Um, there is actually also a footpath running along here, but what you can really see is the, the administrative boundaries um, that basically follow ridges, and that's where paths follow. So um, you sometimes get things overlaid on top of each other, which makes it a little bit difficult to, to see in places. And, um, whereas I think the, the, the cycle streets layer doesn't actually show the administrative boundaries so much, so it concentrates more on paths and tracks. And one of the other things I got interested in was, was adding street names, and uh, this is actually from my slides last year. I didn't, I didn't update this uh, visualization, so it's, it's a little bit out of date now. But um, Eto World um, make the, this visualization, and they compare the OpenStreetMap data on road names with the Ordnance Survey's locator data set. Now, locator is just a it gives you a road name and a coordinate. And it's not very useful, but what, what the guys need to do, they, they have a, a, a the flag of discrepancies between the two data sets. It's not necessarily that OpenStreetMap is wrong, because there's plenty of time we find on the street that, you know, the street name says one thing and uh, OS data says another. So, you know, it's sometimes it can be quite clear. Um, I think. And often it's, it's useful when it flags up areas where there's just streets that are missing in open street map. For example, new housing estates have been built. I think the Lewis Cater gets updated every six months. Um, and so sometimes there's things that you'll find in new housing estates that get added. Often though, people will spot that housing estate before it gets added to the Lewis Cater. And you know, it will be already mapped, um, although maybe the street names aren't added because there's no signs being put up for a new housing estate. And this is just a, an example here. This is also, there's somebody who creates a website called 
Oh, it's okay, they're musical chairs. <laughs> and uh, yeah. it flags up the differences. And this is just an example in Glasgow here. The OS locator says that this is called Gibson Street, and which is on the other side of the River Kelvin. It's not. It's signed as Elmwood Street. The house there, number 56, has a plaque on the door that says 56 Elmwood Street. They've obviously had a problem with people thinking they live on Gibson Street. So, Open Street Map is correct. The order of circle located data set is wrong. So, what it does on the street, we've got Highway Tertiary Race, which is 113 Street, it's called Elm Street, not named Gibson Street. So we have said, actually, this is not called Gibson Street, and that flags up on the comparison tool that we know it's, it's a, an error, and so the, the error tool doesn't kind of flag that up anymore. Um, and, and I've just added a note saying, you know, that's, that's why, why, why I've changed that. Um, this is as of yesterday, I think, that uh, Open Street Map was 97.8% of the, uh, the streets in Northern Survey Locator. Um, and, and I think in Scotland we're fractionally better off from 98% of the streets. So uh, as of yesterday, there's 1,560 streets um, that are in Ordnance Survey that are not in Open Street Map. Um, but I'm not quite sure how many streets there are in OpenStreetMap that are not in the OS locator. We don't actually have that number. But I know of quite a few that I've added and that other people have added that are in OpenStreetMap and are not mapped anywhere else. So um, at some point we'll hopefully get that fair for you <laughs> and a visualization for you. So, yeah. right, so. so we've got six councils that are complete, and I put that in inverted commas because it's something that's always changing. Um, and we're comparing one data set that's pretty good against another data set that's pretty good. And all we're doing is saying, well, these match 100%, but they don't actually match 100% because there's bits there. We've got data streets that are not in the West locator. And so it's, it's not quite perfect, so, but it, it's, it's an interesting game and kind of something to do. I suppose another thing I was going to talk about, some of the things I've been adding, I mean, um, the map, Three years ago, it was had most of the streets and the main roads and things in it, but there's lots of land use and things. It was quite blank in, in places of the highlands, you know, there's not actually that much there. Um, so I was going around and adding in fields and woodland and things, because actually it gives you a good sense of what, what the environment is like. Um, so, so this uh, on, on the right here is um, this is the railway line just south of Perth, and it's, you know, it's a journey I've made quite often, so I was just looking out the window, working out where the farms were, and then mapping them from, from the area of the um, uh, And this is Loch Inch up there, Aviemore, and the Inch Marshes, which, you know, again, it's quite an interesting area in terms of just land use, that actually that whole area is, is, is a marsh, and it floods every year. It's, it's of interest to people like RSPB who were here yesterday, it is actually all our RSPB reserve, so kind of just mapping these things and where there's woodland and so on, it just kind of makes the map look a bit nicer and it makes it a richer map. Um, yeah, so, let's say, natural environment. Um, mapping hills and so on, and paths, rivers. This is right in the middle of the Monobia Mountains on the, on the left here, and it was pretty much blank. There was, you know, there was nothing really there, and so I just went in and I kind of I walked some of this area and I knew where the main rivers were and added those and then traced the big and added in the peaks from, from the Ordnance Survey, how to copyright maps and um, where, where I was able to get the, the heights of the hills, I added those. So, okay. and, then, and, and on the on the right here we've got the two, Scotland's two national parks and I think the data for the English national parks we made uh, open data uh, earlier and uh, those, so those boundaries have been added, or people have just roughly walked them and added them. But uh, the two national parks of Scotland were missing um, when the Ordnance Survey released the, it's the 1 to 250,000 layer. And actually, that shows the national park on it. It's not brilliant, but it was good enough that we could actually get those added. And I think since then, people have gone in and they've tweaked the data and improved it in places and uh, sort of refined it. And I think that's kind of how the whole process works. That somebody adds something, it's not perfect. Um, and then goes in and somebody else tweaks it. So 
So now Scotland's two different parts are, are on the map. And, um, so if people had made a start at putting these in, but they, they weren't being displayed. Um, how per student? Well, that was up to my job until a couple of years ago, or a couple of months ago, actually. And I was working on uh, developing small high power scheme, so it's kind of an interesting thing. So um, on, on the left here, this is the Glen Doe scheme that you've probably heard about. Um, this is the largest um, scheme in the UK that's been built recently. Um, so mm -hmm. I did that, I, I did the tunnel. Because I knew where it started, I knew where it ended. Um, I'd actually been in the end when they were constructing it as part of a visit. And so I was able to work out, well, it's on the ground, but I know it's, it goes in a straight line between here and here, so I know the start and end point, so I might as well add it. Um, on, on the right here, this is a scheme um, just up north of Inverness, and again, I've added some underground stuff. So on the bottom here, you can see the data view. Um, so some of this stuff, although it's, it's in the map, it doesn't actually render, but it's not a problem, we might as well just add it anyway, because somebody might come up with a visualization that visualizes underground things, and the more it can get added, the more data is there. So the next kind of thing I suppose I've been involved with the students in building outlines. Um, this is just a couple of areas of Glasgow for comparison. Um, and these are actually as it, as it is just now. Um, near to the left, it's kind of an area where nobody's really mapped it that much. I mean, all the streets are in, um, all the bus stops are in, railway lines and so on, the motorway you can see, but there's no houses. So you don't really get a feel for that area. What's that area like? Um, on the right, it's just it's fairly close you know, geographically, but you can see that these two areas are actually quite different in terms of we have detached houses with quite a lot of green space, um, and then we have an area of more dense tenements and streets. And, you know, it actually gives you a feel for for the urban character, which just seen street layout you might not get. Um, also, again, it makes the map more useful, hopefully. And then the logical next step is, is adding addresses. And this is something that maybe a lot of other maps don't have and aren't showing. Um, it's, it's something I've been involved with. This is, again, it's, it's something you can add. Once, you, once you've mapped all the buildings in an area, it's like, well, what, what next? So, um, what next you can do the addresses? You, kind of, you get to the point where it's like, well, let's just map everything. Um, there's two different areas here and they're mapped in different ways. So do you, do you map the building as an area with, a, with an address or do you map the front door? Um, there's some been some discussions that actually for um, for blind people to be able to use the map better, they want to know where the door is. And that's sort of the useful thing is to know where the front door of a building is. Where, how do you actually get into that building? So do you map that node with a number? Um, it's, I don't know, if there's, I don't know if there's a consensus. But the thing is, even like on the left there, you can put a nose at the entrance uh, with an entrance, entrance yes. equals main, and then it'll um, so sort of figure out that. And then if there's multiple entrances, you can add multiple entrances. You can, yeah. yeah. The same ones up. But if you do it on the left, you can see this is this is one building, um, just at the top left, but it has multiple numbers. It's multiple flats on one building, so different ways of adding. So. I don't think there is a right way of anything in open street maps. Um, change. It's, I think we've got to the point where the map is getting pretty much complete in, in several areas, so mapping things. Um, this is the, the Red Road Flats in Glasgow that were demolished uh, last summer, and uh, I think they were removed from the map within two hours of being put up. Oh, well, they actually went with demolition. Um, somebody else added the M74 extension to Glasgow and it was on the map, you know, I think it was a couple of hours before it was actually officially opened, it was changed from a motorway construction to a motorway that opened and the Strathclyde police were saying that they didn't get, they were trying to police the M74 and it wasn't on the, the urban survey maps that they were using and so they were talking about that last year, so I think it was six months before it was on there and it was nine months before it appeared on, on Google Maps um, and, and it was pointed out yesterday that the, the bridge to nowhere um, in, in Glasgow, again, it was added as open to cyclists within hours of the map. 
Um, this is the, the Commonwealth Games venues, and you know sometimes when you're mapping new features, you don't actually have aerial imagery of, of the ADIS. It's, it's a case trying to work things out. Um, this this is the aerial imagery as it is currently. It's not the aerial imagery as it was when I was mapping this. So the, the sort of green and, and yellow lines, so those are my GPS traces. Um, over a couple of days, I kind of cycled around working out where the new roads are. So, so this uh, kind of feature going up here, this is a new road, and you know that was just a green site. Um, and then this is the new um, uh, velodrome and, and, and features. So I took a series of photos and straight lines between them, was able to work out well, that's where the building is, and, and kind of showed a building on there. Um, since then, obviously, they've updated their imagery. And, no, that's been refined, but it's kind of where we are. Can you just say two, two or three more words about that? That sounds like an interesting way of doing things. Yeah, so, um, I mean, uh, basically, you know, this, this is, at the time, this was all a big construction site, um, and, you know, you couldn't get onto it, so you couldn't cycle down here to work out where the edge of this building was. Um, all I could do was cycle along this road, but from this point here, I could take a photo and I also cycled up this road and you know, took a photo at that point and I knew that the building was a straight line between those two points. GPS angles on cameras are not very accurate. Um, I've found a lot of the time, you, know, you take a photo and it will tell you that actually it's pointing 30 or 90 degrees out. You know, it's, it says it's looking that way but actually it's, it's not very accurate. So the easiest way is to take two photos and draw a straight line between them. I will say that this not very often so it's quite fair. Uh, done it where like I'll kind of walk two or three steps and then the GPS kind of has this line on it, the line of the bit, so you know not up to the building but looking at least three steps across the road. And yeah, I mean, the that, same thing do that from every angle and join them up. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just find that actually the GPS isn't that accurate because you know, for example, here that was cycling down the same side of the street. I think you know, I don't, I don't think I was quite you know, there's a lot of things where. You know, this, these three lines are actually all cycling down the same cycle path, but the GPS is not that accurate. I think this one here was actually going across, that's a now pedestrian crossing. So it, it does pick something up, but it, I don't think it can be that accurate with the GPS. Um, whereas I think, you know, you can do so accurate within sort of 20 metres. Uh, they, used to, they used to be kind of the rule of thumb in the map, but if you're not entirely sure the GPS traces right, go away and do two or three traces but leave about six hours between them and that way the satellites will move around enough because sometimes the positioning of the satellites means you're not going to get an yeah. accurate enough or even just it's still interference or that. I, th I think these are different tracks taken on different days and you know I, I, I had a lot and actually but none of them really light up and I'm pretty sure each day I was cycling down the same bit so you do get a lot of interference it's not perfect but you know, when you're talking about a building that's you know, 70 metres by whatever that is, I'm not quite sure how big it is, the velodrome, but it's, it's big. I mean, you can see that Celtic Park, so it's, you know, it's the size of a football stadium, so it's a big building, so it's, you don't have to be that accurate. Um, I thought I'd just quickly touch on some of the map sources that we've got available. I mean, the thing in the aerial imagery is, is available to trace over, um, although there are problems that it's not always up to date, you know. Um, it, and um, also you find that it's not always aligned properly and at different zoom levels it's not even aligned with itself so that's a bit of a problem. We've got the Ordnance Survey um, open data street view, it's nothing to do with Google street view, it's completely different, it just happens to share, share the same name. Um, and it's quite useful because it shows you where things like schools and police stations are but again they're quite often out of date and um, there's lots of schools in Glasgow that have been closed and they're still showing up the street. The urban survey is, is schools and actually now they're housing developments. So again, it's, it's not always perfect. But using a combination of different map sources um, and also getting out on the ground. Um, I've also shown you know, the cycle streets layer. You can use that as a background because um, it's quite useful to show. Well, it shows the contours. You can see which way rivers flow, for example. And then down the bottom, I've got three different um, so historical urban survey maps, and these are provided by the National Library of Scotland. So we had Chris Fleet in yesterday talking about some of these, and these are ones, um, this is just a couple of shots of Glasgow, where you can see you know, things like old railway lines, and see where old stations were. Um, 
this here, this is the M8. Um, it used to be a canal. So just kind of interesting things like that. And actually the Monkland Canal is mapped under the M8. Um, uh, and now for something completely different. <laughs> um, humanitarian open street map is something that we've heard Bob talk about a little bit and that kind of gives you just a, an introduction to, to the humanitarian open street map team. And, you know, they're basically they're doing disaster mapping and um, I'll show the video of Haiti and I think that's kind of one of the poster child thing of, uh, you know, it's that that's the, people use that to make a really good example but there's a lot of other ones that they've been doing and, and doing to prepare this mapping, creating map before the disaster um, and also doing outreach and training and providing things for people. It's not something I know a lot about but I think it's a really important cause and I think I just wanted to touch on it a little bit. So this was um, the, the centre of the main town in, in Haiti before um, the earthquake. These are some screenshots of open street map that were on I found on BBC News and did an article that kind of illustrated this and you know it was pretty basic, it had the main roads and that was about it. Um, within a few days, people started tracing the map and adding detail, adding where you know camps and things were, and where, where there were facilities. Um, and within, you know, I think this is about 20 days later, you know, it, it's pretty much the best map that's available of the place and, and it was used by the default map. By, by the rescuers, aid workers, and um, I think these can be used in lots of other places. This is the preparedness thing. They're, they're, they're creating maps of areas of the world where there are no maps available or, or no detailed maps. The best mapping might be some one to fifty thousand maps that were created by the Soviet Union, you know, fifty years ago, and that's that is the best map that exists. So. Um, and, and these, quite a lot of these areas are at risk of natural disasters and conflict and, 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 and there's you know, projects like one on Nepal um, supported by the World Bank where they're, they're going out and they're mapping everything and um, adding you know, critical infrastructure and so on and creating maps with, of things that didn't happen uh, and I think this last point also, you know, empowering just both decision makers but also citizens to say you know, this is a map of your community, you can now see what is there and what what do you want to be there? Um, and, and it gives them information that was not available before to make decisions. Um, and I think the other areas of, you know, the humanitarian team have been involved with is this outreach and, and training. Training people to map their own communities. It's not just Westerners doing armchair mapping. There is quite a bit of that, um, and I've been involved in that, but it's also going out and teaching people. So, this is in, in, in Bangladesh, you know, getting people to go out with a piece of paper. Um, we heard the, the International Rescue Corps talking yesterday about the fact that actually if you're in a, an area and you don't have power, you need a paper map and that's, and that's maybe the best way to do it is to go out with a bit of paper and draw on it. People can draw and say this is where something is and then later on you can go back to somewhere where you have people, you know, maybe GIS professionals, maybe locals, get them involved in, in editing the map. And, and sort of curating their own area. Um, I think the other thing I was on the question yesterday, how do you actually contribute to open, the humanitarian open street map? I mean, there's a, basically there's a tasking manager, it's called, basically it lists a whole series of tasks or problems, areas where the humanitarian open street map team have got aerial imagery and they think there's, they want to improve the map. Um, so if you just go to tasks.hotosm.org um, and for example Pakistan was hit by an earthquake recently and so they're trying to map that area. When you click on a, on a task you, you come up with a view like this and it gives you a series of squares. So each task is divided up into areas and you can select an area, so this orange square. So the red ones are red with some of these map flows and they've mapped and mapped and marked and said I've finished this area. Um, so you can select, and basically over on the left it says, you know, map building paths and, 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 and roads from, from the big imagery. Um, and, and, you know, they, they, they will tell you to what, what to credit. And some of them give you quite a lot of information about what they want. Other areas, they just, whatever you can add. 
and then you just go into this is just a screenshot of the ID editor. They just go in and click on an area, and somebody's added this already. So they've added this, and it's marked in as a wall, but the buildings haven't yet been added. So there's some detail there, not everything. Um, and, and really just finally, so my input for what, so you can see up in the top left, that's uh, Scotland, that pretty much where all my mapping has been, but, um, you know, there's other places around the world, so, you know, um, in, in, in Mali, in, in Uganda, um, and refugee camps, and then areas in, in Indonesia where there's been flooding, um, just kind of different things, they're not necessarily anything really connecting these other than these are areas where somebody has said actually we need a better map here and it's something that you know there's imagery available I've gone in and just spent you know an hour or two just tracing that and helping to create a better map and, and hopefully that's useful to people. Why do I do this? Well this is something that um, I spotted after the, the State of the Map conference in Birmingham. Um, this is just not a sound user. Now, for me it's like playing SimCity except that I ain't getting Earn karma points when somebody's able to use my data. I think that perfectly summed up why I like doing it. So that's really everything I want to talk about. I'm pretty much out of time, so is there any quick questions? Yeah. Um, have you done any kind of um, more sort of deeper um, metadata stuff, so things like widths of cycle lanes or surface quality, um, you know, drop curves, little things that actually enhance the metadata? Yes, I mean, uh, it sounds, um, for example, along a lot of the cycle routes in Glasgow, I was going around and adding whether, whether they were lit or not, what the surface type was. Um, not always adding surface quality, um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I understood that, and I think it was from reading one of the Cycle Street blogs that you know they can their routing engine now accepts you know the, if it's a if it's a paved surface then they, you can cycle faster than you can on a, an unpaved or a, a mud surface. So you know things like that, and yeah, you can add lots of data. It's and you know there are sort of other QA tools that show where this information has been added and where it's not. So I've done a little bit of that, but not, not a huge amount. Yeah? Why, if the Bing imagery exists, would you not just use that in some places? Um, it's not always up to date. You know, it can be two, three, four years out of date in places. Um, it's often not that detailed, um, so you can't see the feature you want to add. Um, and often it's, it's not aligned perfectly, so you know there's all of the data in OpenStreetMap is you know done from say GPS traces and, and, and other sources, and then the big in the imagery could be out, especially for the lost hills, it kind of sometimes gets a bit gets a bit confused. So, so you trace the thing inside the view of the base and stuff, and then you Yeah, I mean it's 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 one of many data sources and it doesn't have all the information, so I suppose it's uh, and it's not always correct, you know, it's not always up to date. I think that's the main reason not to use it. It's also sometimes, you know, if the imagery was taken on a, on a cloudy day, the, there are clouds in the imagery and there are areas where, you know, there's deep shadows in between buildings. You can't actually see what's happening. Um, and, and the only way to fix that is to get out and look at it or, or compare it with another map. But if you have by placing and making a map open, if you actually interpreted it, and if someone's using the map, that interpretation is much quicker to use and much easier to use than the picture in the post case. So even if Bing image is the only thing that you have available, the map that you use to plot it is, is a better map than the picture. I'm just wondering about um, this humanitarian mapping because it's um, it's a kind of forum for discussion. So obviously, like, for example, mapping might be However, they can be sensitive and often prone to conflict themselves and become targets of the violence. So I'm just wondering, like, is there some kind of established forum for this discussion? Just so, for example, the humanitarian agencies are aware that there, there can be be mapped and that other people might have access to this data. Yeah, I think there is. And, I mean, there's, there's a one of the mailing lists. Um, is the humanitarian street mapping have their own mailing list, and they are 
Um, I think there are rights for two X parity. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and they do kind of wage with, with a lot of groups. It's, it's, you know, it's not something I'm really involved with. I'm, I'm just a mapper. It's something that I've, no, I've done a bit of, but it's, um, it is kind of a well known. Sorry? They're well known by the UN. Yes. Yeah. And the, um, the Tuscan server that's done on the show where it's like this disaster has happened, that. I think there's a bit of quite a lot of people to know stuff, but it is kind of curated in the these people running it. And they, I think they've got one full time person, possibly. I think, yeah, I think a few full time There'll be coordination with the UN and other agencies. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the, the, they've actually asked for the map rather yeah, I mean the tasking manager is unlike some things in OpenStreetMap, and a lot of OpenStreetMap is just you can go and do whatever you want and you can create whatever you want, whereas that is actually somebody saying these are areas of what you think. And you know, I could just go to the tasking manager and set up a task so that certain people can do that. So.